And we are live. Is this episode seven, gents? I think so. Ridiculous. Welcome. Uh, Matt, how are you? Not too bad. Thanks. How's everybody else? I'm doing All pretty right. well. Nice. Yeah. Here. Eric, what weather's good down there in the uh, in yeah, Southern yeah. Cali? Good. It's a little toasty. I mean, we know, but we're in about that 80 degree thing. It's September, late September. It's always a little bit toasty. But October is like really great. It's great weather. It's cool at night, 70, you know, that typical horrible San Diego weather, 73, no humidity, you know. Ridiculous. Now, let's not just make anybody <laughs> jealous about where you live. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are Wednesday, uh, uh, weeks away from uh, political mayhem in the United States of America. And in the rest of the world, we're dealing with uh, a pandemic and some other things. But here on New Shooter Weekly, we're going to chat about gear, about the industry and all that stuff. And uh, we've all known each other for a long time now. And I think that what we decided is for this week, it's really a chat about some new gear and some things that are going on. Um, before we get into some stuff that's up on the New Shooter site... Eric, um, you have two cameras in house right now, and I think you 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 know mentioned to us that they kind of dropped into your lap almost simultaneously, which are the uh, Sony A7S III and the Canon EOS R5. What's the uh, initial thoughts on those two? Uh, well, yeah, no, they're interesting cameras. Um, the, first, the the A7S III dropped about four days before the R5 came in. So I kind of had a little bit of a running start with it. And, you know, my, my initial, I guess, reaction to it is that uh, I really kind of like it a lot. I mean, it feels better in the hand for some reason. I think it's just a little bit fatter grip. Um, and the most important thing with me with cameras, the very first thing I want to see beyond anything is what does color look like? You know, I, it's so important. That's the beginning of the perfect image to me. You know, I can deal with other things, but I got to have really great color and accurate color, not skewy color. <laughs> and, and I really am enjoying the A7S III color. I'm surprised, at, you know, how well can, sorry, Sony is just pushing their color science. Every single camera release, it keeps getting better. I don't know why it's taking this long because, you know, the Venice is a really good looking camera and you would think that they would have this color science thing going on between the whole company, but maybe not. <laughs> now, uh, the, the also, of course, the, the ISO range on that camera is, is, is nuts, but it does have those low megapixels. So I'm struggling a little bit with that, thinking about like as a true hybrid camera, I know it's really more made for video, but if you really wanted just one camera, could you get away with those just 12 megapixels? And I'm actually surprised how good those crops look. I did like a couple of over 100% crops on some flowers, and I was really surprised how crispy those crops looked. So those are some pretty nice pixels that they're using in that camera. Now, as far as the A5, I'm sorry, the R5, uh, I also, I like the way that, that camera feels in hand. I think I enjoy the way uh, a Canon feels in hand more so than the Sony and probably even more so than the Fuji Film X-T3 because it's pretty small, but I, I like that camera a lot. Uh, as far as color science goes, it's pretty pretty much Canon, uh, but there are some little caveats. Actually, today I was trying to get a, the C200 and the R5 to somewhat match, and I did have to make some changes to the C200. I'm actually using those changes right now on the camera. And I got really close. Uh, I was going to try to show the side by side, but I wasn't ready to do that today. Uh, but I did have some, and I was sharing a little bit on, on Twitter, uh, with, especially with the a A7S III. I actually got it to almost look exactly like the C200. And that's crazy, because those cameras generally have very different color science. But surprisingly, they were kind of matching up. So uh, yeah, pretty cool. I'm excited to get more uh, together with these cameras. I don't know how I'm going to review them both at the same time. Maybe I'll just do some sort of like mega review or user experience review because I think a lot of the information on the camera is already out there. And uh, I think a user experience article uh, might be a little bit more, I don't know, more interesting or fun, fun to read. It's more interesting to write, that's for sure, than being a, doing a technical review. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, in both of those cameras, I, I would say, 
are being looked at by people in the same and then also in very different ways. Canon has always been that company that, um, you know, more so than anybody else, is releasing cameras that we are at least expecting are going to be true hybrids, right? We don't expect Nikon or Nikon to be a company that's releasing something that we're always saying they're going to trump everybody when it comes to video features. We're not expecting Sony to come out with, um, especially in the, you know, the S series, a camera that's going to trump everybody in terms of stills or photo features. But we do have that expectation when it comes to Canon cameras. They sort of sit in that middle place. So I'll be interested to see that. I do actually have uh, Benjamin has a question for you, Eric, that I'm just going to pull directly from the chat. And mm -hmm. here's the question. Uh, so, and you can see that up here. Curious what Eric thinks about the Pictor Zooms. I know he's been using them, at least looks like he has in pictures. <laughs> uh, you want to tell us what these things are and what your experience so far has been with them, if any? Yeah, actually, uh, so far I do like them. Uh, I have both of the Zooms and they're S35. They, uh, they, they, they ship with a PL now, so, but they have a, a great set of shims for both. So you just you kind of have to put your uh, engineer hat on and, and shim them up and keep checking the back focus because they will not be uh, parfocal if, if you don't have the right shims on. So okay. I, I've been kind of experimenting with different, you know, different cameras, like are the, is the EF, um, if the EF mount on the C200 going to be the same, as like the EF mount that's on the Z cam, and so far it seems to be uh, proving a very, very close. They're they're both. I got both of them going on, and uh, and they are very part vocal, very smooth. Uh, but I don't want to give away the farm because I am doing the review here. But uh, I like them. They have they have interesting character to them. They're not technical like uh, like surgical, whatever you want to call them. Uh, uh, lenses. They have some character to them. Um, and uh, but they're an incredible value uh, for under five grand for the set. So if, uh, there's a lot going on there. Lenses are, are really like this are becoming incredibly affordable. And I know that sounds crazy because that's a lot of money. But we're talking about cinema zooms that are 2.8 and full on parfocal. So hmm. pretty impressive. That's cool. OK, great. So uh, Matt hanging out over there in Tokyo. Uh, what's this thing about? This little this little camera. By the way, forget the picture. Just show us what the thing looks like because you have one. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, so it's tiny. There you go. It looks we'll smaller the, than uh, the, uh, yeah, look at that. See the bad Panasonic autofocus, so apologies for that. <laughs> <laughs> Take a while to grab on. Well, What lens go. is that, we by the way? Again. Contrast, you know that uh, this is the eight to sixteen. I think f two point eight to f four. I think so. And it's a pretty small lens. So I mean, obviously you can see it in my hand here, like how tiny yep. it actually is. I'll just turn it around so you can see a little bit more of it. That's smaller so, than the uh, than the Canon camera. Remember the the uh, the low light king. What is that? The S something. Oh, I shot a video for Canon on that in their Yeah, studio. the little box camera. Similar. Yeah, yeah. Probably a little bit a little bit smaller than that one there. Yeah. And then yeah, if yeah, you yeah. flip it around on the back, I'll just pull these covers off quickly. Is it all quarter so, twenty so, taps so, or are there any three eight yeah, sixteen? They're all quarter twenty. So there's they're all quarter twenties on the here's the autofocus going wacko again. It's coming. <laughs> there it is. Maybe hold it there. If you get a drink, there it oh, is. There it'll show go. up after. You can do you can do a shot, and then it'll come back in. There you go. Perfect. So bottom. I'll try and hold it in the same place so the autofocus on the side, mm. on the top, and then on that side. So you got three. Whoops. Yeah. I can't even see what I'm doing here. So you got two three quarter bottom, twenties three basically on, each, yeah, on every on, on every side. on every side on there. And two on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then if we go back, I'll go back to the back for you here. We'll see if it eventually grabs focus again. Mm. Well, there we go. So th these are all the inputs and outputs. So you've got SDI, and it's a 3G SDI, full-size HDMI, uh, BNC timecode in and out, uh, BNC Genlock. Uh, there's an Ethernet port there, uh, USB-C. Wait, that yeah, USB-C. Yeah, at the top right. here, 
you've got uh, headphone jack, obviously, in a 3.5 mil input. And then on the side over here, there's a DC. Um, hey, Matt, is it, is it using the uh, Panasonic batteries that they use for the EVA 1? No, this, this was the weird thing that, that, like, this only just turned up two days ago, I think. And the problem, the problem is, is that I have no way of actually powering it remotely. I can only power it off mains power because it actually uses the same batteries that are in a DVX 200. Oh. So Seriously? I, thought, oh, maybe I, can, I got a few yeah, of those thought, around here. That's I thought maybe story. I can use the battery from a, from S1H or an S5, but no, no, it's the wrong battery. So I was like, oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> I can only use it when it's hooked up to mains power. And those batteries are actually pretty expensive. I think the 83 watt hour version, which is the largest one, I think they're about 360, 370 US dollars, which is a lot of money for a battery. And you don't get a battery if you buy this camera. They don't sell it with one. So you have to buy that sort oh. of separately. Mm. Ah, it looks a lot like, like a Z-cam sort of small red. You know, it's all, this is, seems to be like that, this, this box camera is kind of coming back around. I'm a bit surprised the Panasonic decided to make a Micro Four Thirds version of that camera. It seems odd to me. Maybe they just got a bunch of Micro Four Thirds GH5 sensors laying around. I don't know. <laughs> it's the, what is it? It's the first uh, Micro Four Thirds video specific camera they've come out with since the AF100, isn't it? I mean, that's really yeah, that's the truth true. of it. Yeah. That's, I that's mean, true. that's, uh, and, huh. Interesting. It would have been a really uh, great opportunity if they had added like some ND to that. That would have been a real, mm. a real treat for that camera. I'm not, I'm not super convinced about about its usability. What do you think, Matt? I think you know, despite being called a multi-purpose box camera, I think it's it's fairly niche in a lot of ways. I think given the fact of its size and its capabilities, and the fact that it doesn't have a screen or built-in ND or built-in XLRs or anything like that. I don't think it's sort of a, a camera you want to confuse with a, a regular sort of digital cinema camera. I think it's more specifically going to be used for live streaming, multi-cam scenarios. Um, obviously, I guess you can tether a whole bunch of these together so and, and then control them, obviously, all at once. So for doing like uh, motion array rigs, it'll probably work very well. Uh, outside broadcast, obviously, if you're using Panasonic cameras in, in that capacity, then integrating these into, uh, you know, use as remote cameras for sports or outside broadcast or, you know, concert, live concerts, anything like that, this will work um, pretty well. Again, you know, you can use it as a traditional sort of webcam for live streaming, but, you know, we've seen all these other cameras now get that capability. So that's not really, I think, a huge selling point of, of this camera. And yeah, <clears throat> I mean, it's interesting because it's it's $2,000, this camera. So it's basically sitting about the same price as a, a Zcam E2. So, you know, th they are fundamentally slightly different cameras. The, the Zcam E2 will offer you a lot of the same type of functionality as this camera, but obviously you get extra things like internal ProRes recording, uh, the ability to record um, ProRes RAW externally um, on, on the camera like that and slightly higher frame rates. So, I mean, this is an interesting camera, but again, you know, you they're recycling the GH5S sensor. And so it's it's literally a GH5S that's been put into a box. In, in, you know, that's the simplest way of, of describing it. Uh, no full V-Log, so you've still got V-Log L like you had in the gh 5 Yes. Now, Panasonic is saying that they've been able to squeeze an extra stop of dynamic range out of there in the highlights, apparently. I mean, I haven't tested that yet to see, you know, what it actually looks like and how, how much different it is. But, you know, I, I don't know. I think it was sort of, I don't want to say it was a missed opportunity. You know, I think a lot of people thought, you know, maybe they could have bought out something that was more like the, you know, the AF100, which we were talking about last week. You know, I think this mm -hmm. was a good opportunity to be able to bring out a micro four thirds sized small digital cinema camera that had obviously built in NDs, XLRs, you know, and sell it at a competitive price. I think that would have made a lot of sense. For me, this one here is, is difficult because, you know, it's multi purpose. So they've had to make a lot of compromises in, in involving how you actually control and use the camera because obviously there's no screen on there. It's the only way to control it is to actually use it over Wi Fi or, um, Bluetooth using the Lumix Tether app 
or you can, sorry, Lumix Sync app, or you can use Lumix Tether by hooking it up into directly into the um, into your computer. Um, it was interesting because I was like, uh, this is a, it's a little difficult because you need a monitor. So I tried it with a Ninja Five on the top on there, but then the problem is, is obviously you don't have any touchscreen control that you're used to with using hybrid mirrorless cameras, at least the latest ones. So making changes to things is difficult. There's four function buttons on the camera, but only one of them is labeled and three of them are located on the front of the camera. And you can assign some of those, but it was sort of weird because you think with something like say Aperture, which you're going to be using a lot, you'd be able to actually assign that to the scroll wheel mm. on the dial on here. So I'll bring it back so you can see it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the controls it's, on there. So this, oh, this, I see. this scroll, sorry, it's yeah. the scroll, yeah, and, scroll and wheel the, here. There's a there's a lack of uh, of any kind of monitoring like like menu monitoring or anything right like I know that the this, this ZCam has that tiny little half inch display on there that's pretty much just shows you you know whether yeah. you're rolling or you know what the mon with, with the tiny little menu you can scroll through the menu but it doesn't seem to have that on there right you have to s depend on uh, on an external monitor to see the the changes that you're making in the menu correct. Yeah, and this was sort of the weird thing is because you, you had to literally hook up a monitor in the first place to be able to go in and turn the Wi-Fi functionality on to then be able to control it with something else. So virtually mm. you need a, a, need a monitor. And I don't know whether because this is still a prototype version, but I found once I made changes using the Wi-Fi app uh, and then I actually turned it off and I turned it back on, it reverted back to completely different settings. So it didn't keep the, the settings on there. And here you can see this is just hooked up using the Lumix um, tether. So this is basically going USB-C straight out of the camera into the computer. And you can control a lot of the functionality. You can do white balances. You can control, um, obviously, your focus if you move it around. There, as you can see with the mouse on there, a little laggy. What I was surprised is the actual, I mean, the picture quality is really good actually coming off out of here. And, and with this system too, you can actually record directly to your computer if you wanted to. Um, if you were using this sort of system and controlling the camera over Ethernet from a distance away, someone remotely can actually record the footage on the computer uh, and, and you can get a pretty good uh, quality file coming, uh, coming, coming out of there. Uh, it, it was interesting because going back to saying using the Ninja 5 and having problems, particularly with that scroll wheel, I mean, it's default to shutter. You can't change it to anything else. It's just shutter speed. So it's like, why can't you change that? So if I wanted to change the the aperture, for instance, I have to assign it to a function button. So then I have to press the function button and then I have to use the scroll wheel to change the, the f-stop. So if you're going to use a camera like this in that type of capacity as a sort of regular digital cinema camera, it's a little tricky to use. I actually found the best thing to do was actually just grab an iPhone and mount it on the top and then just use the Wi-Fi connection on there because then at least I had touch screen control and I had an image coming through and actually the lag was very, very minimal on there and the quality of the image I was seeing was was actually pretty good. And Panasonic's also opened up an SDK to developers with this camera. So hopefully what you'll be able to do in the future, which should actually probably make a lot of sense, is if you can tether your camera directly to your iPhone, for instance, using the USB-C cable and then send the camera control and the picture over that way and then have no lag and have instant control, if you're using something like the brand new you know, iPhone that's got a pretty good display on it and it's very bright, it might make for a, a very sort of compact and sort of unique solution. Mm. So that's interesting. It, 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 yeah. It's, it seems like, uh, I know Panasonic's got a different idea for this camera than maybe we all think they do. Right. Cause, because I, th I think it, I don't, I don't think they're thinking it of being rigged up like a cinema camera. I think they're kind of, it sounds like they're trying to go into that other direction. Like you were saying how it's maybe built for something else, but like everything, you know, a company will build something for a certain purpose and us users will always turn it into something completely different and find another way to use it. Um, what do you think of that? Do you think that that's something that uh, that Panasonic is thinking? It was interesting because when I had the briefing with Panasonic about the camera, you know, they're obviously stressing the fact that this is, you know, a multi-purpose camera. So they were saying, well, you can use it for live streaming. You can use it for multicam. It's a good camera to throw on a drone. It's a good camera to put on a gimbal, onto a car mount. 
and, and also they were stressing that you can use it as a regular digital cinema camera. They provided lots of lots of pictures and information showing the whole thing rigged up with monitors and and everything else. I think it's exactly as you said, Eric. I think you know you, you know you can use an iPhone and go out and shoot a movie. Is that the best option? Probably not, but it doesn't mean that you can't do that. And I think with this camera here, it, it's whatever you want to make it, you know. Is there better cameras suited for more traditional purposes? Yes, I think so, but there's no reason why you couldn't use this camera in a, in a you know, whatever capacity you wanted to. It's probably a good camera to just have because of its tiny, small size and being micro four thirds, you know, it's easy to mount other lenses to. Um, it doesn't draw much power. You could just keep this in your bag as a, B camera or an emergency camera because the ability to obviously be able to control it, uh, you know, over Wi-Fi or whatever, if you're doing a you know, whatever type of shoot, you need an extra camera to get a wide shot or, or whatever else, you know, you could just pull this out and literally just clamp it on a mount or something like that, control it and then, and, and then use it. I do think it's probably for me, maybe slightly overpriced. I think this camera would probably would have done, We'll, we'll probably do better if it was more sort of around the thirteen, fourteen hundred dollar US mark. Sure, mm -hmm. and it, so and it's kind of yeah. like, would you grab that one over a GH five or GH five S? I mean, if you had them both on the table and they were both the same price, I mean, I don't know if I would pick the box camera. I think I'd probably want to go for the hybrid, uh, the GH five or GH five S camera. Yeah, or even something like an S5, you know, for the same sort of money. Um, again, it depends on what you're going to be using it for. Uh, it, there's a lot of advantages to something like a hybrid DSLR or mirrorless camera, like a GH5S, for instance. And they, I mean, they've come down in price and it's actually cheaper than this BGH1 now. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I was weighing it up and going, well, what are the advantages and disadvantages of both these cameras? And they can both be used in, in very sort of similar capacities. Is it extra, you know, worth the extra money getting the SDI in and out, and your gen lock and your time code and, and those sort of things? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it depends on the application. Yeah, yeah. and those two it's, things are a big deal, right? Because I mean, if you are going to be tying these cameras together, you're going to want the G. You're going to want that gen lock. I mean, you're going to have to have if you're going to be switching it. And yeah, and then of course, good old SDI. We know what that means. That's solid connection. That's that's what you want. So mm. maybe that's maybe that's the uh, the extra yeah dough paying for it. You know. It, it does seem to me that it's a mixed message. I mean, I think it's a really interesting camera in the sense that it does have time code, it does have gen lock, sub $2,000 US. At the same time, it doesn't have what could be considered a rock solid autofocus system. And we're talking about live streaming and things like that. And we're matching those cameras up. And as we move to smaller and smaller crew production and we start to you know link these cameras up, um, a strong AF system seems to me to be a huge advantage in those types of situations. You lose a screen, which you get with the GH5S. You lose the battery that comes with the camera. You lose the ability to just use uh, what I think, along with Sony, is an excellent um, audio solution to be able to get XLR you know, inputs into your camera because, to my knowledge, or maybe I'm wrong, you can't just pop that you know, uh, audio unit onto this new camera, but you can with yeah, the you GH5. Can. Oh, you can? Okay, you can. so that's yeah, yeah, good. Abso okay. Absolutely 100% compatible. So there's a 3.5 mic input. It's got two okay. built-in stereo microphones in the front. And yes, it will integrate directly with the, the Panasonic XLR module. It's got a the, the obviously the hot shoe connection on the top and you can just put it straight on there. So yeah, that, that's sort okay, of good. makes sense. Okay, well that that's regard. good. Okay, well that's good then. Okay, so from that standpoint, that's a that's a plus. But I still think your $400 or sub $400 but close to it battery and everything else, really you're talking about your entry point. Even if you get an inexpensive monitor, you're probably looking at $3,000 as a starting point for this camera, it sounds like. Um, so there's a lot of other cameras in that price point and, uh, you know, making that decision becomes harder now than I think ever before. Um, interesting. Okay. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, it's like a, it's like an NAB IBC camera. You know what I mean? Something you would see in a, in a glass box at the, at the booth in a way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, who knows what, what they're thinking, but maybe this is sort of a, this could be a feeler, you know what I mean? Like, Hmm, what do people think about this camera? I mean, what, you know, the things we say right now might, you know, they might be listening and wondering, yeah. okay, we'll yeah. make some changes because we don't really know if, 
you know, what, right now, right, Matt, that we don't really have like a, a solid shipping date or anything like that at this point. It seems kind of yeah. like it just uh, next next up. month. Next month, it's supposed to start shipping. But the, you know, let's take a look at the at the at what's happening right now with the industry. And we take a look at the two pocket cameras from Blackmagic, which I think are great examples of, you know, cameras that we should be looking at along with a camera like this. And if you take a look at the A10 Mini and the A10 Mini Pro and the, uh, the new ISO, and you look at the integration between those pocket cameras and that switcher and what you can do, um, it seems like, you know, we're talking about a much more powerful package that's coming from black magic i'm not trying to knock this camera i'm just looking at what the industry has and i think we're beyond feelers right now you know we can see where where the industry is going and what people need and if i'm looking for something look black magic cameras don't have great autofocus either but if they nail autofocus in the next round of pocket cameras you know, and they put an articulating screen on those cameras, and you have the integration with their switchers. I mean, you're really talking about something that can be very, very powerful in a lot of those scenarios, in my opinion. So well, I guess we'll That's see. That's a great point. That's actually a great point. And, you know, uh, that integration that Blackmagic has now, like you said, with the ATM and uh, Pro and the, the pocket cameras is pretty incredible. Oh. I mean, you could, you could do focus, 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 I had to mute for a second. We're going to see if we can get um, Eric back. Uh, his audio went a little weird, so let's just see if we can come back into that. Eric, <laughs> let me hear you again. Hey. I'm gonna I'm gonna have you Does step out for a oh. second. No, it's a little robotic. So um, just do a quick okay. step out, and I'll let you back in, and then uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Let's right. see what happens. All right. Oh wait, Eric, stay oh. where you are. Yeah. Start talking again. Let's see if it's back. <laughs> are we working now? Yeah, yeah. It just well, it just went a little it went a little crazy uh, for a second, and it went really robotic and stuff. Um, but I think you're back. So oh. the last thing that was, I think, clear is you're talking about that integration is, is you know, really key and stuff. And just pick that up from there if that's okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, like you were saying that, it kind of makes me think a little bit about the potential for something like this for Panasonic to come up with. I mean, they they make switchers. Like, I mean, they make everything uh, broadcast. This could be an entry to something competing in that space for small uh live streams that's not going to cost uh, you know the the operator you know fifty thousand dollars to just get up a small running kit so it's interesting Good yeah point. yeah and we talk about i mean maybe not so much worldwide but especially in in a place like the united states um a whole other segment of the market here is uh houses of worship which is a big industry for the camera companies um, in this country, especially. I mean, they have teams that are focused on just that. And the fact that, you know, you have a company like Black Blackmagic doing what they're doing, they're really, in a lot of ways, targeting those, you know, those houses of worship with those switchers and what they're doing, because they are um, the people that are live streaming all of the time. But of course, we are seeing just uh, an enormous explosion of virtual events and things that are being done as well. And that has accelerated beyond what we could even imagine in the last six to nine months. Yeah. So I, I would say that camera companies should be really looking at this very, very seriously. And, and to me, the only company that is really ahead of the curve at the moment seems to be black magic except for maybe in the autofocus area because they have uh they th it was almost a coincident with what has happened with the pandemic you know they released the a10 mini a10 mini pro the integration with the pocket cameras and uh they seem well poised yeah, uh, to you know to take a huge so portion of that yeah interesting okay um and, and it's not going to change too much. Like we still have another six months or so, at least almost a year of this. And, and, and even if it did say the pandemic ends, I yeah. think this streaming world is become, is going to become so mature with all the things that we're doing on it now 
I, I don't know if it's just going to go away. I think, geez, look at what the presentation that Apple did yesterday. Like you could not do a presentation like that, right? Outside of a, an, in an auditorium. That yeah. was an, an amazing, it was like a film. It was a crazy good. So yeah. just like what we're doing, like everybody's upping their streaming games, right? So why would you want to abandon something that's actually working? It's giving people some more freedom to not have to go to a, a you know, a specific event. And I don't want to say like NAB is going to be fully like that anymore. Uh, but I mean, in the business climate, I mean, it, it's a whole lot less expensive and a lot easier to have a meeting online than it is for, you know, all the corporate offices to meet in Milwaukee. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know, uh, you know, speaking of the, the Apple event, um, I know that I'm doing a lot of, um, remote production work now with clients. And I know that Eric, just by the nature of your entire industry in terms of news, that that's happening all of the time. In fact, the set that you're, you know, sitting in right now was designed for remote production and being able to use that. Um, and I don't know what kind of experience you've had, Matt, on your side over in Asia and, and the trends that are happening. I think maybe not in this week's episode, but maybe next week or the week after, it would be really great to have some focus on remote production and what that means in 2020 and the changes that we're starting to see and the asks that are coming in different industries in order to pull that off. And whether that's an interview for you, Matt, for a documentary and what that means and what conversations you have with people because of the pandemic um, or for you for news or for me for corporate, um, you know, do we feel that this is a, a slice in time or are we now starting to create a new way of moving forward overall with production? And I'm not talking Mandalorian here. We're talking about you know, the day in, day out, nitty gritty of getting production down. Um, would you both be open to looking at it as a topic and maybe even bringing somebody from the outside in who's doing some something in another field? Yeah, you know, I, I will yeah. say that it, it is our station locally, uh, or at least even even in this market, you were seeing more talent and uh, reporters going back to the station. Like, for instance, my wife is oh. anchoring right now at, at the station. But during the week, she's doing Zoom interviews and I'm shooting her stand ups right here. So we're, she's not going out in the field as much, but they are trying to get, you know, their anchors back in the set. And I'm glad because I'll be honest with you, I'm a little bit I'm fatigued with the living room shots, especially with the low res shots. I think we're seeing it in every market. You know, it's, it's, it's but in national news, it's all iPhones and crappy laptops and it's, I'm getting fatigued by it. You know, I, yeah. there's ways that we can do this to be safe. Uh, you know, I, I just want to be able to see a little, a little bit nor more normalcy when it comes to, to, to broadcast, but we'll right. see. How about you for Matt over there and, and for the type of work you do, have you seen shifts in terms of not just have, how you have to work, um, but just sort of remote production and asks um, related to everything? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess still in, in the same sort of context of, of, of news and, and productions, I guess because people can't travel and stuff, there is a lot more remote stuff happening, particularly, uh, I, I guess, like, you know, Skype interviews, for instance, recording Skype interviews. And as Eric said, you know, that comes with its own inherent um, problems in terms of the quality uh, I, I guess we've all seen it now on tv news specifically where you know even correspondents at home who don't have anything set up correctly they're sort of wedged in a corner somewhere with a laptop that's looking up their nose uh, you know where the audio is pretty horrible the lighting can be pretty bad and i think you know inherently that that's probably i think even though people are sort of accepting of it. I think people actually do notice when the quality of things does go sort of down. And I, I can understand completely why Eric's wife has gone back to the studio to anchor because there's a certain sort of, I guess, more level of professionalism that, see, that comes with seeing somebody on an actual news set or actually lit up correctly or a nice shot with good audio as opposed to somebody sitting at home, you know, in front of a computer, a computer screen. I think that's sort of a, 
an underlying thing that sort of gets into people's psyches that they sort of some you know they become familiar with something and maybe the information becomes more valuable to them if they see somebody sitting behind a proper anchor desk than they do getting that information from someone looking at a computer screen interesting cool Agreed. good yeah so let's um let's keep that conversation going and maybe put our heads together and see if there's somebody who's also maybe doing some remote or virtual production in uh, commercial or narrative and have an, an overall conversation about that because I think we all have some interesting perspective on that. Um, there's another boxy camera out there that has finally entered the true um, post-Stormtrooper phase and, uh, and, and custom color phase, and that's this little camera from, uh, from, from Red, and this red digital cinema Komodo is obviously been out in the wild for a little while now. Um, if we want to just take a camera and kind of put it into perspective as being something that is almost the opposite in terms of what its target audience is and application, I would say that the Komodo might be that camera when we compare it to the new Panasonic that just came out. It's a $6,000 camera. It's a little bit more standardized than anything that RED has done in the past in terms of the cards that you use and you know the power that you're using with it and stuff like that. But it's very clearly a RED camera. You know They want people to think about this camera from a usability standpoint as something that's geared towards shooting uh, narrative, you know, scripted content. This is a cinema camera in their minds. And I wanted to get both of your perspectives on this camera. I'm actually going to start with you, Eric, and just tell me kind of how you think about the Komodo and, and where it sits in today's landscape, because we did have a comment that, you know, big conversations right now are the 5000 to $15,000 U.S. landscape and, you know, where cameras sit in there. So what, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's an exciting camera. I think it, uh, it has a lot of interesting features. I'm not going to go drilling down through every single frame rate and what it can do, but I think what what really strikes me as a, a great decision is the global shutter, especially for a camera that's going to be used a lot in that sort of, I don't know what they call crash cam or attaching it to a car or a motorcycle. Uh, having that global shutter is really going to look great. Um, it, it, the, the mount going RF was also, I think, a good decision, but unfortunately, it's not really shipping as an active mount for RF lenses, I believe. I don't, it's shipping with the adapter still for an EF, which is kind of odd. Like it feels unfinished in that aspect, but um, you know, I don't know if you really like thinking, I want to buy this camera to use RF lenses. You might have to wait a little while. I'm not sure. Um, I also like the large uh, screen on the top. Um, you can control the camera. You can see what it's doing. You can see the color. Uh, you know, it's, it, this seems like a very th well thought out top display, uh, nice and nice and big, considering how large the camera is. Um, and then it has internal, you know, raw, red raw. So that's huge. Uh, people that are familiar with red raw will, you know, love this camera. And plus it has ProRes as well, internal. Uh, I mean, all in all, it, it those things... I look really strong. Obviously, I've never touched the camera, so I've never used it. I can't really comment on on its picture quality and its performance and yada yada. But those those things stand out to me as uh, some really cool, well thought out uh, ideas and design. Now, it do it uses two batteries, and I, I I'm not sure if it's because that camera is super power hungry, uh, or it, it just uses it for longer run times. I didn't look at the actual uh, wattage uh, that the camera requires, but that's an interesting thing. I guess you can hot swap them, which is great. Uh, we all sometimes roll too long and, <laughs> and realize, oh crap, I'm gonna run out of a battery cut. So if you don't have to do that, it's pretty great. Uh, but I think that's interesting. I mean, other than that, I mean, it's, you know, it's exciting camera to be able, if you want a red and you got like six grand plus maybe another couple grand for accessories, because that's always going to hit you with a camera like red. 
you know, you're going to, you're going to buy that. I mean, it's makes a lot of sense, but it, it's not going to be, don't expect it to be a, you know, a, a premier red camera, right? It's, it's a smaller ac accessible camera. Hmm. Interesting. Um, what about you, Matt? What do you think about this camera and where it fits? It's an interesting camera. I think it's mainly being targeted at two audiences here, existing red owners who want another smaller, lighter B camera, or sometimes to, to use something in as an A camera in that capacity, or it's, you know, it, it's targeting that market where it's very hot right now. Obviously, you know, that five to, I wouldn't say even say 15, maybe five to $10,000 market is, is highly cramped and it's fairly lucrative because this is where you're getting a lot of owner operators now buying cameras. That 15, you know, or 12 to $25,000 range has all but sort of evaporated in terms of the market. Um, and then that's why we're not seeing sort of cameras being released at those sort of prices anymore. So you've either got really expensive cameras at the high end which, you know, Red, Ari, um, Sony, obviously Panasonic as well do. And then you go down to, um, you know, this bottom end, this five to $10,000 thing. And it's, as Eric said, this, you know, if you traditionally wanted a Red, you had to spend a lot of money. You had to buy proprietary media, proprietary, um, a lot of proprietary accessories to make it work. And the cost was, was pretty astronomical on top of whatever the brain was that you were buying. This is a more affordable camera, obviously, because it uses readily available media, um, batteries. Uh, there's going to be a lot of aftermarket, obviously, mounting solutions for it. Uh, you know, it's an interesting camera. Is it the same sort of camera that someone who's looking at, say, a C70 is? is? I, I don't know. I think because... It, Again, it depends on what sort of you're doing without those sort of built-in XLRs and without the built-in ND, although you can obviously get adapters with the RED cameras that have the ND in there. It'd be interesting to see how many new users RED picks up or people who are now going to become trying to get into that RED ecosystem because I think that's probably a big part of the future for, for RED is obviously, I think, moving to this lower-end market where there's a lot more people wanting to wanting to buy cameras. I think it's going to do reasonably well. I think mm. with any red camera, you know, there's always a ton of hype surrounding it. It's just the way that they operate the cam the the company and market uh, how red does sort of business. So I think you have to be very aware of a camera like this. I think it's a camera you should go and try before you end up buying it because there's obviously a lot of pitfalls and things with red cameras like crop factors and and little bugs and quirks that are out there that maybe a lot of people who are not familiar with red cameras, um, you know, are not aware of when they just go and purchase one. So I think it's one of those cameras. I think you probably need to go and try one first before you sort of jump in and buy. But then again, you know, I think it's going to be a lot more popular than I think a lot of people are thinking at this point in time. Yeah. And it seems like um, previous red owners who can't necessarily invest in the Monstro or some of the higher end cameras, but we're in some of those, we would call them lower end red cameras. This is an interesting move for them because now they have the option to move into a camera that has similar features to what they, they, they had um, previously in some of the less expensive uh, red cameras, but for a lot less money with sort of that equalized battery system, you know, media system and things like that. So... Um, you know, they also gain some of the newer technology that's um, that's being put into the red cameras, and of course, the bonus is that they are getting that in an even smaller form factor without having to build out, a, you know, a, a relatively modular camera, which has its advantages and disadvantages. But I think going back to you, Eric, and also sort of to what you're saying, Matt, we can't expect this camera to be, nor do we think that RED is pretending that this camera is a C300 Mark III. You know, this is not a, an FX9. This is not a camera that you just take out of the bag and it's a run and gun camera and you're shooting three or four different types of projects. It's a little bit of narrative here. It's a little bit of commercial, maybe on the smaller end scale here. It's a music video there. You know, it's a documentary. You know, it's a corporate uh, video. That's not what the Komodo is, at least in my mind. But I don't mm -hmm. think that Red has ever pretended uh, unlike what we're talking about with this Panasonic camera, instead of having clear vision of what it is, and uh, and they're 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 slotting it, I think where where Red 
is is putting it yeah. in my opinion yeah so. yeah and i think you guys both kind of nailed it on the head it, it's going to be if you're a red owner i mean why wouldn't you buy one of these this would be like the most inexpensive b camera to match your a camera right yeah i mean the the value of that is is incredible now the color science i mean i can't imagine it being different than uh, than a red i can i mean i can understand maybe some of the uh, the image being maybe a little bit different but hmm. i can't imagine that the color science would be completely off i have not seen anybody or anyone matt you know take the two cameras side by side and, and do that sort of two shot thing with it but uh you know i mean if it does if it is consistent i mean this is there's just no reason why you wouldn't buy it if you already are in that ecosystem sure yeah especially if you're used to the whole production to post workflow with red you know if you've got that down and you know what that is this just becomes um a great b or c and and also for some people it's that entry point you know they've wanted to be in that red ecosystem for a long time and this gives them that opportunity to do that it just doesn't get any better i mean there's just so many choices right now across the boards if you're complaining go shoot something okay get that's right. all i got to say if you're complaining well, complain. and you're not yeah if you're if you are complaining it, it, it too much, then you're probably not out there just doing production. That's just what I got to say. Yeah, about I mean, that. okay, look, yeah. We thought that Red was going to make a camera like ten years ago. That what was that four K for three K? No, it's three K for three K. I think was the original three K for three yeah. K. Right, that was yeah. the original Scarlet. I think. Um, I mean, it, that never happened. And I, and I think at one point everybody was just like, you know, we're never going to see a sub ten thousand dollar Red camera ever. Yeah, and the yeah. fact that they pulled it off. You know, I mean, they're not they're not a big company like Sony and Canon, and Panasonic. You know, those guys are giants in the in the business. They don't they have so much more, you know, technology and money to use it. I mean, the fact that Red was able to pull off a sub seven thousand dollar camera actually is quite impressive. They're, they're they're a pretty small company, but they got they got they're loud and they got big dreams over there. Yeah, yeah. And they're and they're and they're based in the U.S. too, which I think really has to be you know brought up to the front and center of this because being it, there's a lot of um, I don't care what anybody says if you are doing business in the United States there are huge hurdles that you have to go over in order to to produce a product that don't necessarily exist in other places in the world. It's not easy to to design and make a product here you know just the patent process alone in this country is just ridiculous for somebody so the runway is so much longer from concept to completion than if you're you know making something in china and of course what we've seen over the last few years and i think both of you would agree is the quality of product that's coming out of china is so much higher and i'm not talking about iPhones that are basically being manufactured you know they're being uh, they're being assembled in china i'm talking about the stuff that's being produced by companies like zcam you know we're we're getting real cameras that are coming out of china that are not um you know, American companies. Aperture, look at what they're doing as a company. Let's talk about DJI, who now also owns Hasselblad. I mean, there's some pretty heavy hitters in the industry right now that are coming out of that country, but they don't necessarily have to do business the way an American company has to do business, which is, um, which is not easy. So, you know, hats off to, to Red for pulling off a $6,000 camera, which can do what it can do. It's not easy for for that to be done here in this country, to be to be honest. Um, okay, I think that we're gonna leave the rest of this. Um, this is gonna be very much the Matt show now, because we have a new right, fluid head. Yeah, see you later. <laughs> Bye, Eric. See you. Ah! Um, we, uh, articles up on New Shooter. Um, this is really interesting, and, and neither Eric or I have a lot of experience with this, uh, Matt. But this is a brand new fluid head from Sockler. Uh, it's called Active, uh, or at least we think it's pronounced Active, A-K-T-I-V. And can you start to talk to us about what makes this head unique and also how it could pair maybe with the Flowtech, uh, you know, sticks that are out there in the market? What is this thing? 
this is a really sort of interesting um, design move because tripods are something that fundamentally haven't really changed that much, you know, in the last 60, 70 years. I mean, I think the fluid head was invented back in the 1940s. And yes, different companies have gone in slightly different directions and the internals have changed around a little bit in terms of how fluid heads work. But the fundamental, you know, uh, design principle of a fluid head is, is much like sort of a piston engine, you know, it hasn't really changed in a long, long time. And I think that's probably credit to the original design. So we saw Flowtech a couple of years ago come out with the, uh, sorry, Suchla come out a few years ago with the Flowtech tripod legs, which was sort of a, you know, a bold move because you're trying to redesign how a traditional tripod um, worked. And so now this is something that they've been working on for quite a long time and they were trying to get this to come out at the same time as those Flowtech legs, but they just couldn't do it. So this is a new range of what's called active, active heads. And as you can see from this picture here on the front, you see that mechanism that's that, that big sort of, I don't know, it sort of almost looks like one half of a pair of sunglasses on the front there is a balancing tool for the head so what they've done is they've taken away the traditional mechanism that's underneath it so you'd normally attach your fluid head by putting it through the tripod and then you would do it up underneath and that's the way you would undo to level level your ball head so what they've done here is they've actually put that mechanism and put it into the actual head itself so when you pull up on this lever that's how you now balance the head so it's far quicker and easier to do because you're not reaching underneath the tripod. Everything you're making adjustments is all happening right in front of you where, you're, where your hands naturally um, fall. Uh, and I think what's really interesting about this is you would think, oh, you know, maybe it doesn't have as much range or, or maybe it doesn't, the connection is not going to be as secure going down onto your actual tripod. But I actually found the exact opposite. I think because the actual fluid head is sitting lower onto the actual tripod itself. And because of the way it's locking in, you get this really firm connection. So you know, anybody you know who's used a regular tripod with a leveling device underneath, that you know, if you don't do that up really tight, it, it's subject to slightly moving or twisting sometimes. With this, once it's locked, it's locked. There's absolutely no movement because it's grabbing on with this set of very high um, tensile teeth that's keeping it on there. And also by doing this design, if you pull that lever all the way up, it allows you to take the tripod head completely off without having to undo anything. Mm. So they've made a range of accessories as well. So this allows you to actually take it off and then put it onto a slider or something else really quickly. Now there you can see it there. So that's the bit that actually, well, this is a, the slider adapter. Um, so this is a that you can just mount onto onto a slider or something else, and that's the actual pin mechanism that goes inside the head. There, you, you'd obviously be familiar with most tripods where you get that, um, you, you know, the uh, whatever you want to call it that's coming down the uh, the, the screw type sort of thing. mechanism that goes underneath the bolt. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's actually officially called, but. <laughs> yeah, you'd normally have that. So that's been removed. So you sit it on there and you would think that that tiny little mechanism wouldn't be that strong, but it actually locks on uh, really well. And I think for me, when I was trying this out, I, I did a couple of comparisons and I thought, okay, I'm going to try this out next to a, a, a such like FSB 10 that uses a traditional um, bowl leveling system on there. And I was amazed at just how much faster it was to do things. And then when I watched back the video, I was looking and going, wow, look how, how much I'm like leaning over and twisting my back and twisting my shoulders every time I want to adjust the tripod. Having that leveling device on the head means I can stay upright, my back's straight, my shoulders are straight, and I can make the, make the adjustments. It is something that is fundamentally going to take a bit of time for people to get used to because obviously you've got muscle memory with tripods, and I found the first few times I was naturally just reaching under the tripod to make the adjustment and going oh there's nothing there <laughs> so it's something that you need to get used to and they've also put a couple of other small little features on there you can see the ball level on there so this is using a prison system so simple but uh, i like the way what they've done with this because if you put one of these tripods up high my biggest problem with a lot of tripods is that there's no bubble level you can't see it right so once you put your tripod up nice and high how do you level it off correctly because you can't actually see the bubble? Well, because this is using a prism system, you can actually see the bubble when you're putting it up really high or when you're next to it on the side. 
and you know that makes a, a a big difference to how you know you operate a tripod. I love it. It's uh, I mean, That's so cool. I, I and, <laughs> and did you use it with the Flowtech uh, sticks with the the tripod? Yeah, yeah. Satchler sent out, when they sent out this the, this lone head for a couple of days. They also sent out the the seventy five Flowtech legs, and that's where I think it, it works really well because everything when you're making the adjustments to the tripod and also to the head, your hands are always here. You're not reaching yeah. down anywhere. You're not reaching underneath. And the other thing too, by removing that ball leveling clamp from underneath, if you combine mm. this with the Flowtech seventy five, you can put the Flowtech seventy five completely flat on the ground. And you can still level out the head and do pans and tilts because there's nothing underneath yeah. it anymore. So you can actually get shots that you that are like lower than if you were using a traditional like hi hat or something like that. So I think hmm. as an overall package, you know, when combined with the Flowtech legs, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And they've been able to increase the payload capacity on these to a little bit. So even there's an FSB, sorry, there's a Active Six, an Active Eight, an Active Eight T, which features a touch and go. Um, plate instead of a, um, a side locking mechanism yeah. and then there's the active 10 so the active 8 series and the 10 all have I think a 12 kilogram payload uh, capacity so yeah. that brings them up in line with something like the FSB 10 in terms of, of, of weight and that you were just showing before there Gem is, is a separate adapter that they're making um, for sliders so you actually mm -hmm. put that bit on to another tripod or a slider head or something like that, and then you um, just throw the throw it straight on the top. Yeah, got it. Let me ask you a question. Um, do you think that payload capacity is increased because there's a lower center of gravity because of the design of it, or is there some other reason? Yeah, I think that because it's a slightly lower center of gravity and also because I think of the way the design is in terms of where it locks on, I think it's able to handle a lot more weight because obviously the mechanism, I think it's a, I mean, they couldn't show me exactly how they did it, but there's, there's a huge big sort of um, metal, metal coupling rod type device that's going down sort of hmm. almost like going through a maze inside that fluid head that goes down because that's where you have to put the entire mechanism now because it's been incorporated in the head. It's not sitting down in the bottom. So obviously that's strengthening it a lot. And I was actually surprised. This was the first um, like 75 mil fluid head that I've ever used where I sort of felt like it felt like something that like a 100 mil ball, bowl head tripod that you would be using in terms of how smooth it was and the sort of, you know, I've always found with the 75s is that there's always a little bit, they feel a little bit sort of flimsy and don't have as much resistance this one just seemed to have quite a lot of resistance i mean mm. i liked it from the limited time i had trying it out yeah it i would say really that this great. yeah 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 i mean Go it, ahead. it is it looks really great i i personally like a 75 millimeter ball heads because all of my payloads you know i'm not i'm not shooting with big cameras like you are, are matt and with the mirrors once you start adding all those you know the battery and the big lens on there that that's that deserves a a pretty a pretty good size ball head uh, 100 mil probably, uh, and I, but I love the 75s. And you're right. Every time you pull out a 75, it always seems to be lacking. Like you know, it doesn't balance as well. It's not as fluid. Um, yeah. So I'm really, I'm actually pretty excited about it. I know people don't think that tripods are worth the price of admission. And man, I'm telling you, there is nothing better than a great set of legs. I mean, they, it, it will it pays dividends far beyond a camera or even a light at that. Once you buy a great tripod, you keep it for pretty much forever. Now this new Sackler is one of those ideas where, man, this might just want to, I might want to get one of these. This might replace my head because I love the idea of not having to grab the bottom of the ball and do all these crazy adjustments to move it, you know, just popping it up like that. I mean, dang, it's really smart. And, um, you know, Sackler's being super innovative with their design, redesigning sort of things that everybody else was copying their design over the years. And now they're redesigning and I'm sure they're going to try to chase that tail again. But do you think that this head will fit on, say, non-Sackler heads or tripods? Because I've had some problems with certain heads using, say, like a Miller on a Sackler. Uh, they don't tend to fit quite right. At least mine doesn't. Uh, what do you think? Do you think that this was going to be something where if you have some really nice legs you really like, 
you're not you're not using a flow tech could you put this on that on those other legs i don't know i can't say to be certain i guess it would probably depend on on the tripod i think the previously i think one of the big problems was is that obviously the the leveling mechanism underneath was different for a lot of different cameras uh, mm. sorry for a lot of different tripod systems and obviously sometimes you couldn't get it to lock up properly with this one i don't see any reason why it wouldn't work um but again i, I guess you'd have to see and and, and try it out hmm. interesting yeah i mean i think that actually until the the latest crop of uh, miller cx uh heads came out I felt the same way that both of you do that I, the 75 was what I gravitated to, but the CXs were the first time that I felt like I was getting something that you would, you know, think of out of a hundred. Um, so I, I, you know, obviously it doesn't have the innovations of this new active head in terms of what they're doing, but I think that Miller has that, um, half step counterbalance system that lets you dial in very precisely, which I really appreciate. And, um, I've actually kind of standardized on the CX series now for, for my cameras and what I'm doing. Um, but you know, they had the speed leveler which was really interesting, Socklow did. And I think that the fact that they didn't just rest on that and innovating that and then the flow tech sticks um, says what you're saying, uh, Eric, which is they're innovating. You know, they're, they're not just saying we're just going to create a better version of the existing um, fluid head and sticks that are out there. We're going to basically create a, a new system. And quite honestly, for the people that are out there, who are in documentary, who are in news, who are in corporate production, um, you know, we're not getting any younger. And anything that we can have to, to our aid that helps our bodies, I think are, is a huge win for the industry. And clearly, if I'm not bending down and putting my body into those strange positions, we all agree that the tripod is, it's the thing. You know, our tripod system is the basis. We love our gimbals. We love our sliders. We love all this. When it comes down to it, um, you can get 95% of what you need on a good tripod system. So um, it's interesting. Did you throw your Amira on this at all, Matt? Was that something that you tried or not? Uh, no, I mean, I've, I've, I've currently got a fairly serious injury, so I was in no condition to be picking up yeah, a, yeah. an Amira yeah. and trying it on there. I imagine it would probably it would work i think mm. given the payload capacity if you didn't put too many accessories on there and I, I mean i just want to add too that it's a pity because you see so many people buy rubbish tripods and put expensive cameras on there and i i just don't get it you know you wouldn't put retreads on a nice car but people <laughs> seem to think that they they should put an expensive camera on a really crappy tripod and, and i think fundamentally because of the design of cameras because they've got smaller and now we're seeing all these cameras that don't have integrated evfs in particular is yeah. you know you're getting all the people shooting here at this level again and then people obviously doing everything handheld because they think oh it's a lightweight camera i can just hold on to it rather than actually putting it on a tripod so i don't know I, i'm just seeing way too many people out there who shooting handheld when there's no reason to be shooting handheld but that seems to be the style that, you know, that there's going forward. Yeah. Breach it. Okay. Breach it. <laughs> With that wisdom, we end <laughs> off another episode of News Week, uh, News Shooter Weekly. I knew I was going to screw that up. Just, I rethought it. Come on. Start? It just, our, just as well. our, like we are, hour three, hour four almost. <laughs> Can you believe it? Um, I I, so quickly, I, you guys are good conversations. I like this free form. We obviously want the chat to become even more lively. Love the questions at the beginning. So let's um, get more people on here. If you're not subscribed to the channel, please do. Um, there's also a form up there. Uh, there's Patreon. And we will be back next week. Um, there'll be some more stuff to chat about. Anything else we want to end off with, gentlemen? With uh, Matt, you've already said you've given us your wisdom already. We're gonna we're gonna leave it there. That's wisdom, uh, Eric. Any last words? Um, I think one thing I would like to ask is uh, for the viewers: is look, what do you guys want from this show? I mean, we're we're we've done a few. We're we're in. 
uh, we've kind of came up with our ideas on what we want it to be or what we think we want it to be. But really, it's all about what you want. And we want some feedback. So please give it to us. Tell us what you would you would like us to do. If this is all rubbish to you, then we'll, we'll, we'll scrap it and we'll restart and do it all different again. But we want to know what you want because we want to make this uh, something that will grow and be interesting to you. So that's my words of wisdom. It's actually I'm looking for your words of wisdom. Great. I appreciate it. Yep. And I agree with you. Uh, everybody, thank you for coming. Let people know. There's obviously a replay. And till next week, episode eight, whatever that's going to be. Uh, gentlemen, take care. And everybody in the chat, all the best. Take care. Thanks for watching. See you.